paraphernalia. I'm Nikki Strong, and this is VOA One The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, Dan Friedel tells us about the effects climate change is having on a small Alaskan island. Brian Lynn presents this week's science report. We close with the next part of our U.S. history series. But first, here is Dan Friedel. The Alaska native village of Shishmaref sits on the sinking barrier island Sarachef in the Chukchi Sea near the Bering Strait. The island lies between the United States and Russia, where it is increasingly threatened by the effects of climate change. The village is home to about 600 members of the Inupiat people, they live simply, without running water and other modern technology. Rising sea levels, flooding, increased erosion and loss of protective sea ice and land is a huge concern for the villagers. Some want to leave. In fact, the community has voted in support of proposals to resettle elsewhere. Yet, more than six years after the last vote, Shishmaref remains in place. The planned move costs more than the village can pay. So the community carries on toward a troubling future. The villagers continue their traditions. They celebrate birthdays, baptisms, and school graduations. Their lives center on their homes the local school, and one of the world's northernmost Christian churches. Aaron Silko leads the local Lutheran church. He called the concern about the shrinking land and floods too much of a burden for the community. He said, if the villagers think about climate change too often, it will hurt their ability to live their lives. It will take away from things such as birthday parties, funerals, and sporting events. There is still life happening, Silko said. Rich Stasenko agrees. He moved to Shishmaref in the 1970s. He calls the community resourceful and resilient. I don't see victims here, he said. In the 30 years since 1992... The U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association says temperatures in Alaska have gone up by 1.4 degrees Celsius. That area of the Arctic had been warming twice as fast as the rest of the world. Now it is warming three times faster. The island already does not have much space where people can live. It is only about 5 kilometers long and 400 meters wide. It used to be protected by a large layer of ice that is melting. The lack of ice means more flooding and more problems from storms. The sea is reclaiming the coast. About 14 homes had to be moved inland in 2002. There are many towns in Alaska, like Shishmaref, that are having problems due to warming weather. Most of the people that live in the small towns are native people who are related to the first people to live on the islands. The U.S. government's Accountability Office says climate change is expected to make their problems worse. Lloyd Kiyutaluk is president of the local tribal council. I'm scared that we will have to move, he said. 
He does not want the government to say the situation is an emergency. But the way things are, we're getting storms that we've never seen before. Government leaders warned that the island would have a problem during a storm in September. Officials said it could bring the worst flooding in 50 years. As the storm moved through the Bering Strait, it cut electricity, destroyed an important road, and flooded a human waste treatment center. Molly Snell, 35, talked about the storm. She said she hoped the village would not be forced to evacuate. The right storm with the right wind could take out the whole island, she said. She said the island is more vulnerable due to climate change. Over time, the community has changed its ways. However, the people of Shishmaref have not contributed much to climate change. Most of the greenhouse gases to blame are produced by populations in Europe and continental North America. Elizabeth Marino calls that situation an example of climate injustice. Marino is an anthropologist, or an expert on humans and their communities. She studied the people of Shishmaref and wrote a book about her findings. I'm Dan Friedel. Next is this week's Science Report with Brian Lynn. Researchers say they have discovered new evidence that Mars once had a large northern ocean. The finding adds to existing evidence that ancient Mars had the right conditions to possibly support some form of life. Today, Mars has a cold desert climate. Any water is believed to be in the form of ice because of the planet's extremely cold temperatures. But there is a rich amount of evidence suggesting that rivers, lakes, and even oceans once existed on Mars. For example, a 2015 study by the American Space Agency, NASA, suggested that 4.3 billion years ago, Mars likely had an ocean that covered nearly half of Mars' northern hemisphere. Another NASA-supported study, published in January, estimated that 3 billion years ago, the climate in much of the planet's northern hemisphere was very similar to present-day Earth. The study noted that at the time, Mars likely had a much thicker atmosphere than today and had an active northern ocean. Now, two American researchers have released a set of maps they say provides new environmental evidence of a large ancient ocean on Mars' low-lying northern hemisphere. The team collected data from satellite images of Mars. They then combined these images to create topography maps of the planet's northern hemisphere. Using these maps, the researchers said they were able to piece together evidence of shorelines that sat at the edge of a huge body of water about three and a half billion years ago. The scientists recently published their findings in the Journal of Geophysical Research, Planets. The team said it used software developed by the United States Geological Survey to map data collected by spacecraft operated by NASA. 
the research uncovered more than 6,500 kilometers of ridges that are believed to have been formed by flowing water. The scientists say the ridges likely represent the leftover evidence of eroded river systems and an ancient ocean floor. The team said its research also suggested large levels of sediment, providing further evidence of a large ocean. Benjamin Cardenas was a co-writer of the study. He is a professor of geosciences at Penn State University in Pennsylvania. He said in a statement, the area of Mars studied, now known as Aeolus Dorsa, contains the densest collection of water-formed ridges on the planet. Cardenas said the study's findings demonstrate the possible ocean in that area of Mars was very active and interesting. It was dynamic. The sea level rose significantly, he said. Rocks were being deposited along its basins at a fast rate. There was a lot of change happening here. Cardenas added that areas on our own planet containing water-formed ridges and sediment provide researchers with much useful information about an area's climate and life forms. If scientists want to find a record of life on Mars, an ocean as big as the one that once covered Aeolus Dorsa would be the most logical place to start, he said. The team noted that the major goal of NASA's Mars Explorer, Curiosity, is to look for signs of ancient life on the planet. Currently, Curiosity is operating within the planet's Gale Crater, which is in the southern hemisphere of Mars. In the past, researchers have also found evidence of past water systems around Gale Crater. In addition to providing more evidence of a large ocean, Cardenas suggested the new study also provides useful information on Mars' ancient climate and developmental history. Based on these findings, we know there had to have been a period when it was warm enough and the atmosphere was thick enough to support this much liquid water at one time, he said. I'm Brian Lynn. Now, here is a question for you about Brian's report. What kind of data did the researchers use to reach their findings? A. Infrared image data B. Atmospheric readings or C. Satellite images If you said C, you are correct. As Brian said, scientists used the satellite images to create topography maps of Mars's northern hemisphere. Topography means the shape and other physical characteristics in an area of land. To answer more questions about Brian's report, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com.
Welcome to the Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. The national election of 1832 put Andrew Jackson in the White House for a second term as president. One of the major events of his second term was the fight against the Bank of the United States. In 1836, the bank's charter ended, and the Treasury Department took responsibility for most of the government's finances. Many people considered Jackson's bank veto one of the most important actions of his presidency. Another major event of Andrew Jackson's second term as president involved Texas. The United States had given its claim to Texas to Spain in 1819. Then Mexico won its independence from Spain in 1821. After that, Texas belonged to Mexico. During the 1820s, Americans poured into Texas. Most of the settlers came from the states of Tennessee, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Many owned slaves and brought the slaves with them to Texas. American settlers in Texas were able to buy land for almost nothing, but they had to promise to join the Roman Catholic Church. They also had to promise to obey the laws of Mexico. Over time, Mexican leaders saw the danger of continuing to permit Americans to settle in Texas. The Mexican government sent an official to inspect conditions along the border with the United States. The official reported that as he traveled north through Texas, he saw less and less that was Mexican and more and more that was American. He said there were very few Mexicans in some towns, and these Mexicans, he said, were extremely poor. He said the American settlers were not becoming true Mexicans. They were not speaking Spanish. They were not becoming Catholics, and they were not accepting Mexican traditions. The official said the situation in Texas could throw the whole Mexican nation into revolution. He urged Mexico to send troops to occupy Texas. The situation between the settlers and the Mexican government became increasingly tense. For the most part, there was little that President Andrew Jackson could do. The United States had a friendship treaty with Mexico. The government in Washington had a duty to remain neutral. In April 1833, the settlers in Texas held a convention. They prepared a list of appeals to the leader of Mexico, General Santa Ana. One of the Americans, Stephen Austin, carried the appeals to Mexico City. He spent six months negotiating with the Mexican government. General Santa Ana promised to honor all the requests except one. He would not make Texas a Mexican state, although he said that might be possible someday. Stephen Austin was satisfied. He left the Mexican capital to return to Texas. On his way home, to his surprise, Austin was arrested. He was arrested because of a letter he had written earlier. He had written it when his negotiations with Mexican officials seemed to be failing. He had said it might be best 
if the people declared Texas an independent state. Austin was put in prison in Mexico City for a year and a half. Stephen Austin urged the people of Texas to remain loyal to Mexico. But talk of rebellion had already begun. The settlers were calling themselves Texans. In November 1835, representatives from all parts of Texas held a convention to discuss the situation. They had no plans to take Texas out of the Mexican Republic. In fact, a proposal to do that was defeated by a large vote. However, the Texans took action to protect themselves against Santa Ana, who had declared himself dictator. They organized a temporary state government. They also organized a state army, and they made plans for another convention. Before the Texans could meet again, Santa Ana led an army of 7,000 men across the Rio Grande River into Texas. The first soldiers reached San Antonio on February 23rd. The Texas forces withdrew to an old Spanish mission church called the Alamo. On March 1st, the second Texas convention opened. This time, the representatives voted to declare Texas a free, independent, and sovereign republic. They wrote a constitution based on the Constitution of the United States. They created a government. David Burnett became president. Sam Houston was to continue as commander of Texas forces. On the second day of the convention, a letter came from the Alamo in San Antonio. The letter was addressed to the people of Texas and all Americans. The commander of Texas forces at the Alamo, Lieutenant Colonel William Barrett Travis, wrote, I am besieged by a thousand or more of the Mexicans under Santa Ana. I have sustained a continual bombardment and cannonade for 24 hours and have not lost a man. The enemy has demanded a surrender at discretion. Otherwise, the garrison are to be put to the sword if the fort is taken. I have answered the demand with a cannon shot, and our flag still waves proudly from the walls. I shall never surrender or retreat. The letter from the Alamo closed with the words, Victory or Death. Representatives at the convention wanted to leave immediately to go to the aid of the Texans at the Alamo. But Sam Houston told them it was their duty to remain and create a government for Texas. Houston would go there himself with a small force. The help came too late for the 189 men, perhaps even more at the Alamo, the defenders included some Tejanos, or Hispanic Texans, and the famed frontiersman Davy Crockett. Santa Ana's forces captured the mission on March 6th. When the battle ended, not a single one of the defenders was still alive. Sam Houston ordered all Texas forces to withdraw to the northeast, away from the Mexican army. One group of Texans did not move fast enough. Santa Ana trapped them. He said the Texans would not be harmed if they surrendered. They did. One week later, they were marched to a field and shot. Only a few escaped to tell the story. Santa Ana then moved against Sam Houston. He was sure his large army could defeat the remaining Texas force. 
President Andrew Jackson and Sam Houston were close friends. When told of Houston's retreat, the president pointed to a map of Texas. He said, if Sam Houston is worth anything, he will make his stand here. Jackson pointed to the mouth of the San Jacinto River. The Battle of San Jacinto began at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. There were about 800 Texans. There were twice as many Mexicans. The Mexicans did not expect the retreating Texans to turn and fight, but they did. Shouting, Remember the Alamo! The Texans ran at the Mexican soldiers. Eighteen minutes later, the battle was over. Santa Ana's army was destroyed. On May 14, 1836, Texas President David Burnett and General Santa Ana signed a treaty. The treaty made Texas independent from Mexico. Historian Daniel Feller says President Jackson had to be careful when responding to the situation in Texas. Whether or not Jackson approved of the insurrection in Texas, whether or not he saw it as complicating or easing the path toward eventual assimilation of Texas, there's no doubt that he wanted Texas as part of the United States. Jackson did not want Mexico to blame the United States for the revolution even though the American government had been trying to buy Texas for many years. Jackson believed the country should spread as far west as it could. But he also worried that giving statehood to Texas would deepen the split between the northern and southern states. Texas would be a state where slavery was permitted. For this reason, the anti-slavery leaders in the North strongly opposed Texas statehood. Jackson told a representative from Texas, William Horton, that there was a way that statehood for Texas would bring the North and South together instead of splitting them apart. Jackson said Texas should claim California. The fishing interests of the North and East, said Jackson, wanted a port on the Pacific coast. Offer it to them, the president said, and they will soon forget that Texas is a slave state. Jackson and Wharton held this discussion just three weeks before the end of the president's term. Wharton spent much time at the White House. He also worked with congressmen, urging the lawmakers to recognize Texas. He was able to get Congress to include in a bill a statement permitting the United States to send a minister to Texas. This bill was approved four days before the end of Jackson's term. On the afternoon of March 3, 1837, Jackson agreed to recognize the new republic led by his old friend, Sam Houston. Nine years would pass before Texas became an American state. I'm Steve Ember, inviting you to join us next time for The Making of a Nation, American History from VOA Learning English. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak.